northern Italy, the Viant Valley. October the 9th, 1963. Workers from Italy's National Electric Energy Agency are having lunch on top of the Viant Dam. Today, like every day, they're watching the slopes, enjoying a fantastic natural spectacle. As chunks of Mount Toc slip towards the reservoir. Six kilometers from the dam is the Solvertsene power station, where water released from the reservoir turns four giant turbines. Luigi Rivis is deputy manager of the plant and has been charting the daily slippage of the mountainside. Today's movements are so big, he wonders if there's been a mistake. I got the data about the landslide's movement. I was surprised and I asked for confirmation. From the control room, they could see blocks of rock and soil falling into the water. In fact, the chart showed that the landslide was about to fall. Anticipating the final slip into the lake, dam operators have lowered the water level so that any waves thrown up by the collapse will be contained by the dam wall. Along the slopes of Mount Toc, power company officials insist farmers move their animals off the mountainside. Say this here. At 6 p.m. we were told that the landslide was about to fall and we were asked to go up. Key personnel from the power station are invited to join the engineers on top of the dam to monitor the slide. But Luigi has work to finish. I wanted to go up, but I told my colleague, look, unfortunately I need to do this. So I stayed while he went up. From their privileged position on top of Europe's tallest dam, Luigi's colleagues expect to be eyewitnesses to the creation of a tsunami-like wave up to 20 meters high as the landslide slips into the water. In the valley below, any rumors about the dam have been forgotten for the night. The bars in Longarone are filled with football fans watching a European Cup game between Real Madrid and Glasgow Rangers. A 70 meter high wall of water swamps Longarone and sweeps on down the valley, flattening buildings, killing hundreds. Twenty minutes later, the flood water is gone, leaving Longarone a death-strewn landscape. Longarone has been wiped out. A rescue effort begins, but few survivors are found. Houses, roads, the railway line have been swept away or buried in debris. The total loss of life that night is more than 2,000 including 60 workers from the power company. In the light of dawn, rescue workers are staggered to see that rock and mud have now filled the huge reservoir, and a ghostly M-shaped scar of freshly exposed limestone identifies where farmland had been just hours earlier. Fifty years later, the landslide scar is still visible and still a focus for geologists struggling to unravel the mechanisms that brought destruction on such a massive scale. We are almost at the top of the landslide. And this is the 
failure surface, we can see also the other lateral boundary of the landslide that is a big fault. And from here to there, there is a 1.8 kilometers. Professor Monica Girotti leads the latest research team. The goal of my research is to obtain a three-dimensional model of the landslide to better understand what happened in 1963. Geology will shed light on the landslide mechanism. But one thing is already clear. The disaster is rooted in man's recent intervention in this valley. Professor David Petley leads an international effort to investigate, predict, and prevent catastrophic landslides. Understanding the Vaillant disaster has been one of the most important challenges of his career. Well, Vaillant, in terms of loss of life, is the biggest landslide disaster in Europe in the last century or so. And it has probably been the most important landslide of, of all time because it raised our awareness of a whole series of issues. In 1956, excavation begins for the foundations of the Vaillant Dam. It will block a precipitous gorge to create one of the deepest man-made lakes in the world and generate hydroelectricity to power Italy's post-war economic boom. The chief engineer is Carlo Semenza. A world-renowned dam builder, this will be his final project before he retires. And he knows Italy's spectacular Dolomite mountain range offers a unique opportunity. The Dolomites are a part of the Alps, and they basically consist of big lumps of limestone that have been pushed up to form towering peaks. The steep slopes of the Vaillant Valley appear to make it the ideal location for a dam. The dam could be relatively narrow and therefore relatively small in terms of width, obviously very, very tall, and it holds just vast volumes of water in the valley behind. Semenza and his team of geologists take great care surveying the location where the dam's foundations will be built. But they pay little attention to the valley upstream that will eventually be flooded. In the 1950s, the emphasis was very much on getting the engineering design of the dam itself correct. And really very little uh, effort was put into understanding the upstream geology. It was considered that that wasn't really relevant to the dam or to the reservoir. Petley finds their casual attitude all the more alarming, given the region's well-known geological instability. Between the mountains in, in the valleys are much weaker rocks, uh, sort of sands and clays and shales. And the whole system is folded and faulted, so it's quite disturbed. And that's the classic environment for creating landslides. None of this is news to the local population. They're constantly vigilant for signs of rock falls and landslides. And Mount Toc, adjacent to the site of the dam, has even earned a nickname, the Walking Mountain. Construction continues for two years, and the 261-meter-high dam is almost complete when, on March the 22nd, 1959, a new reservoir at nearby Pontesei suffers a huge landslide, creating a 20-meter-high tsunami-like wave, drowning one worker and overtopping the dam. This was the first time there was an understanding that there was a potentially really damaging effect of big landslides, and it sent a seismic shock through the reservoir industry in, in northern Italy. And it was just this mechanism that caused death and destruction in Vaillant. The mountainside slid into the lake, generating a massive tsunami. The dam remained intact, but the wave swept over it, swamping the valley below. The hydro industry had underestimated the potential consequences of flooding a valley. As a reservoir fills, slopes that have been drained into a deep valley for thousands of years become waterlogged for the first time with surprising results. Rock that appears solid 
is often made of separate blocks held in place by gravity and friction. You have to think of uh, a block, a uh, rock on a hillside, uh, being a bit like a boat. And when water level increases, the block starts to float. It doesn't completely float, it just becomes more buoyant. And as it becomes more buoyant, the friction force, uh, the resistance to movement decreases, and that makes landsliding much more likely. Fearing a repeat of the fatal landslide and tsunami in Pontesay, the power company commissioned a survey of the banks of the proposed reservoir in the Viant Valley. The project's chief geologist is Professor Leopold Müller, and he employs Eduardo Semenza, the chief engineer's son and a recently qualified geologist, to take on the survey. Eduardo walks every inch of the valley, making observations of the rock formations. When he sees evidence of ancient large-scale movement in the steep slopes close to the dam, it looks like the power company's worst fears are confirmed. Eduardo Semenza was convinced that there was a big old landslide located on the south bank of the reservoir. An old landslide has already moved, so the rocks at the base of the landslide are likely to be much, much weaker. Eduardo fears that flooding the valley could reactivate the landslide, which in turn could lead to a catastrophic tsunami, repeating the deadly Pontesse event on a mega scale. The landslide mass that he'd identified uh, was within 100 meters of the dam site itself. If Eduardo is correct, then it could cause the whole dam project to be abandoned. For Eduardo's father, Carlo Semenza, the news is devastating and he initiates a more detailed investigation. If this is the site of a giant ancient landslide, evidence will exist in the underground rock strata. Engineers dig three boreholes into the mountainside in the danger zone identified by Eduardo. And the geology team look for signs of previous movement, shattered rock or unstable layers of clay. Despite drilling up to 170 meters into the rock, they find no evidence of an ancient landslide. Project leader Carlo Semenza is relieved. His chief geological advisor, Professor Müller, is confident the slopes are made of solid, immovable blocks of limestone. The dam designers come to the conclusion that, that although there was the potential for small landslides, on the banks of the reservoir. There was no real danger for large failures. In February 1960, with the threat of a destructive landslide discounted, Semenza green lights the next phase of the project. Before handing the dam over to the power company, they must confirm its structural integrity by filling the reservoir to the top. By October, the reservoir is 170 meters deep, 91 meters below maximum. And the dam is holding up perfectly. But then, a setback. Farmers discover a huge M-shaped crack directly above the reservoir. The, the crack that opened up is really large. It's about uh, 1,700 meters long. It's widening at about three centimeters or so per day. It must have been a terrible surprise for the team. The power company's fears are realized just days later when a slab of mountainside the size of six football pitches falls into the Viant Reservoir creating a wave two meters high. Fortunately, nobody is hurt. But the rest of this colossal landslide is still in motion, and the record reveals a new sense of urgency at the power company. From Eduardo's earlier analysis of the rock strata, they believe the remaining unstable ground probably penetrates up to 250 meters into the slope making a total volume equivalent to 90 city blocks of 30-storey skyscrapers. 
Chief Engineer Carlo Semenza needs to tame this mountainside before the whole unstable mass slams into the lake and swamps the valley below. Semenza's engineering team can think of no way to stop the slide. Its sheer size makes it impractical to pin it to the mountainside with concrete piles. But Professor Muller has a hunch he can control how fast the landslide slips into the reservoir and prevent a devastating tsunami. He believes that if raising the water level activated the slide, lowering the level should slow it down. Carlos Semenza immediately puts Muller's idea to the test and opens floodgates to reduce the water depth. Muller's theory is simply that dropping the reservoir level will let water drain out of the slopes, increasing the friction and anchoring the floating limestone blocks back onto the slope. Over the next two months, the rate of creep slows from three centimeters a day to barely one millimeter a day. This big, massive landslide slowed down and eventually stopped. The consequence was that Muller and Semenza were quite confident that raising the level of the lake again would induce movement and dropping it again would reduce the movement. Even if they can't permanently stop the landslide, the two men are convinced they can control how quickly it slips into the valley. Semenza and Muller propose to ease the giant mass of rock into the lake using the depth of water in the reservoir, like the accelerator and brake on a car leaving the dam free to begin power generation. It's a simple plan, but Petley is aghast. Their understanding of the geology and the mechanisms of, of, of movement of, of this big mass were, were really very poor. And yet, despite that lack of knowledge, um, they embarked upon this extraordinarily bold plan to try to induce movement of the landslide by raising and lowering the lake level. Muller's geology team is confident they can detach the whole mass gradually without causing a dangerous tsunami. But Carlos Semenza is more cautious. He insists on expanding the plan to deal with the worst case scenario, where the whole of the landslide falls into the lake in one catastrophic event, and a tsunami is created. Semenza commissions a study to find out the maximum safe depth of the reservoir, a water level leaving enough dam wall exposed to contain the biggest possible tsunami. Semenza was trying to ensure that the tsunami wouldn't go over the top of the dam. But this is 1961, and there are no computers to run a tsunami simulation. Carlo's team builds a scale model of the dam and runs a series of physical simulations. And the object actually was to see how big the wave could be. The initial experiments suggest a worst case tsunami height of 20 meters. So Semenza fixes a maximum reservoir depth, leaving the dam with 25 meters of exposed concrete, protecting the valley below. At last, he thinks he has all bases covered. Carlos Semenza was still to refine his calculations. But before he was able to do so, he died suddenly from a brain hemorrhage. Without the leadership of its visionary chief engineer, the scheme is plunged into crisis, and the power company puts together a new team to execute the plan and save Semenza's legacy project. September the 26th, 1963. In the two years since the bypass tunnel was completed, the reservoir level has been systematically raised and lowered to coax the landslide down into the flooded valley. And so far, the plan has worked. Two weeks before the disaster, the landslide has moved a total of three meters. The dam operators are now really quite confident about their ability to control the landslide. The reservoir is now the highest it's ever been. 245 meters above the base of the dam, a full 10 meters higher than Semenza's maximum safe level. 
There's not much doubt they were genuinely trying to get themselves to a point where the landslide slipped into the lake. So really they were pushing the level of the lake as, as high as they thought they could get away with. Their high-risk strategy appears to be paying off, and the entire slide is picking up speed. Floodgates are opened to get the lake down to a safe level before the final fall. Dam operators expect that, as seen previously, lowering the water level will also slow the slide. But this time, it's different. Actually, the landslide continued to accelerate. This is exactly what they didn't expect. So they were really quite baffled by what was going on. If the mountainside falls now, their simulations guarantee a tsunami that will spill over the dam wall. For two tense weeks, the reservoir level is dropped as fast as the operators dare, without adding to the stresses in the slopes. But the landslide continues to accelerate. By October the 9th, the mountainside is moving 30 centimeters a day. But the reservoir has now dropped to leave 25 meters of exposed concrete, and dam operators breathe a sigh of relief. Sure, there's enough wall to catch any wave. Because the lake level was now below that maximum size of a tsunami that they'd identified, they considered the situation was completely safe. So safe, the power company managers are invited to witness the creation of the tsunami. And local people are not alerted to any danger. But instead of the predicted 20-meter tsunami, the wave towered over 200 meters above the dam. An astonishing 10 times bigger than expected. Now, our investigators reveal why the plan to control the landslide by adjusting the reservoir level was such a huge error of judgment. Right from the start of the movement of this landslide, their model of the way that it was behaving was wrong. Their geological investigation had failed to identify that located within the limestone, there were thin bands of clay. And those soft clay layers produced a, a, a zone of weakness. The geology team's boreholes, meant to search for evidence of a weak sliding surface, never went deep enough to find the clay. And you're looking for a clay layer that could be 250 meters below the surface, but maybe only a centimeter thick. But it's that centimeter thick layer that determines whether this landslide can move or not. The extraordinary properties of this clay layer ultimately led to the whole side of the mountain detaching at once at incredible speed. Monica Garotti's survey of Mount Toc has revealed the clay deposits that Müller's team missed. These are the clays on which the 1963 landslides moved. It is a continuous layer. When uh, this layer failed, the mass moved. But Garotti's investigation focuses on another quirk of this thin layer of clay. The slaves are an impermeable material that uh, doesn't permit uh, water to pass. A waterproof layer suggests an entirely new mechanism for the slide, never considered by Müller. Rainwater from high on Mount Toc could drain into the rock below the clay and become trapped. The increase in pressure pushing on the clay from below could destabilize the slide surface. But it would need an enormous volume of trapped water to shift the landslide mass. Crucially, Girotti's team have gathered evidence that rainwater from the entire upper part of Mount Toc collected in the limestone isolated below the landslide. After heavy rain, a vast amount of water was trapped beneath the clay. With nowhere to go, the pressure below the clay spiked and the landslide got an extra jolt. It's clear to Girotti that in attempting to control the landslide by simply changing the level of the reservoir, they were missing a crucial element. 
it wasn't a good plan because Müller didn't consider the existence of clay inside the slope. And so it, it controlled only the lake levels, but not the rainfalls. It was a hopeless project. If the original geology team had known about the clay, Petley believes history would have taken a different path. Plenty was known about the fact that clay is a weak material. Um, and so if they'd known that the clay layers were present, they almost certainly would have walked away from the site at that point. When Petley returns to the archive, he realizes just how close Muller came to identifying the clay layer. In 1961, Muller installed four water pressure gauges called piezometers to monitor the water level in the rock. He wanted to be sure the limestone slope was behaving the way his theory predicted. Three of the devices confirmed Muller's expectation that the water level in the rock followed the level in the reservoir. But hidden in the data from the fourth piezometer, Petley finds devastating evidence of a clay layer. The water level in that borehole didn't really respond at all well to, uh, to the level of water in the lake. The piezometer gave a high water reading, whatever the level of water in the reservoir. Well, this is probably an indication that actually the clay layers were trapping water at high pressure underneath the landslide mass. But Müller assumed the fourth piezometer was faulty and its data was wrong. Because the behavior of this borehole didn't really conform to their preconceptions of the way that the landslide was operating, um, it was ignored. For Petley, the seeds of the disaster were sown in this systemic failure to understand the geology of Mount Tark. What it shows is that if the model that you're operating doesn't actually explain some of the behavior that you're seeing, then your model is wrong. It's not that the, the landslide is doing something wrong. And failing to develop your model to that point means that you actually potentially allow a large landslide like this. Petley now understands why the landslide happened. But one final mystery surrounds the Vaillant disaster. Why was the tsunami so much bigger than anyone expected? Professor Petley turns his attention to Semenza's tsunami simulation experiments. The model that they constructed suggested that the tsunami would be relatively small, um, 20 meters or less. The actual landslide generated a displacement wave that was more than 200 meters above the height of the dam. The meticulous scale models should have given an accurate indication of the size of the tsunami tied to one critical factor. The outcome of the model completely depends upon the speed at which the landslide moves. The experiments tested the effect of landslides across a range of slump times, from slow up to the fastest they could expect the slide to move. The engineering team take an educated guess that one minute would be the quickest the real landslide could possibly fall, correlating to just over four seconds in the simulation. But when Petley examines data from the night of the disaster, he discovers that the entire collapse took just 45 seconds. Although just 15 seconds less than their estimate, this 25% error is enough to totally change the outcome of the simulation. The model that they constructed was actually very sensible and very good. But in computer modeling, we, we often use the phrase garbage in, garbage out. Unfortunately, in this case, because the assumption was that the landslide would move slowly, they put garbage into the model, and the result of that was that they got misleading results out. Implementing the spurious results of the simulation had very real consequences. The incredible speed of the final slump has baffled scientists for nearly five decades. The acceleration is, is really very dramatic. It's like the acceleration of a Formula One car. Within a few seconds, this landslide went from moving at a few centimeters per hour to probably about 110 kilometers per hour. Petley now believes he has solved the mystery of this phenomenal final acceleration. And once again, 
the answer is in the clay. And it's extraordinary behavior when compressed deep underground. You've got to imagine there's 200 meters of, of, of solid limestone sitting above this clay layer. Petley has shown that when buried beneath millions of tons of rock, the normally soft clay becomes hard. The material is essentially brittle. It, it's hard and it's strong. For millennia, the deep clay had been undisturbed. But filling the reservoir for the first time created enormous stresses in this thin layer. That allows the clay to start to deform, and as it deforms, it generates what we call micro cracks, tiny little cracks, fractures build up in the clay. The surprising behavior of these micro cracks is the key to the final acceleration of the slide. As the landslide continued to move, these little cracks grew. They extended outwards to form big cracks. And as those big cracks joined together, they formed a single surface through the whole of the clay. Once the micro cracks had spread throughout the whole of the M-shaped slide surface, total collapse was inevitable. Eyewitnesses report the final collapse took just 45 seconds. But Petley's analysis shows this final irreversible phase began much earlier. The 45 second event is just the bit we perceive. But in fact, this final acceleration of the landslide didn't occur in 45 seconds. It occurred over around about 60 days. 60 days before the final collapse, the water was at its highest level to date, just 25 meters below the top of the dam. Up to this point, the rise and fall of the lake has been causing the spread of microcracking. But now, the cracks have penetrated so much of the clay, a chain reaction begins, and the cracks spread by themselves. The microcracking now controls the movement of the landslide. And at that point, the operators genuinely had no control on the behavior of the landslide, even though they thought they did. One by one, the few remaining patches of uncracked clay shear faster and faster, and the landslide accelerates. October the 9th, 1963. Four and a half hours to disaster. Dam operators have been preparing for the entire landslide detaching in one giant event and have reduced the reservoir level to leave 25 meters of exposed concrete. Two minutes to disaster. In the belief the 20 meter high tsunami that the power company is expecting will be caught by the dam wall, the local population is not warned about the imminent collapse of the landslide. And power company workers watch the spectacle from a privileged position on top of the dam. One minute to disaster. Unknown to the dam operators, tens of meters below the mountain surface, a vast, brittle layer of clay has been shattering uncontrollably for two months. And now only one small patch is left unbroken. 45 seconds to disaster. The clay shears, and a landslide the size of 90 city blocks hurtles towards the reservoir. Accelerating as fast as a Formula One car, the impact creates a tsunami over 200 meters high. 30 million tons of water falls 261 meters, blasting a hole 40 meters deep in the valley floor. The narrowing valley accelerates a 70 meter high column of water, and it punches across the valley at around 140 kilometers an hour. Longarone is destroyed in less than two minutes. In 1971, two people were convicted of multiple manslaughter, including the chief engineer who took over from Carlo Semenza. He was sentenced to two years in prison. The power company 
was ordered to pay compensation to the victims. The Vaillant Dam, Italy's celebrated engineering masterpiece, never generated power again and remains a relic in the landscape. Today, engineers and geologists must always examine the slopes of proposed reservoirs and explain why they are safer than the slopes of the Viant Valley. <laughs>